Welcome back to Tactics. Here we are in our very last session of Tactics Training, and I hope this has been a blessing for you. Um, and you've learned some techniques and insights uh, that will help you have more meaningful conversations with non-believers in a way that's gentle and respectful, yet takes them to a place of deeper understanding and ultimately puts a stone in their shoe, a rock in their shoe. I was running up the mountain the other day again, Jack's Peak here locally, and wouldn't you know it, had a little something in that left shoe. And even though I could have kept running, it just bugged me. So I stopped and I wrestled with my sock until I found it and got it out of there. So it really altered my run. See, and we want a stone in someone's shoe to change their thinking. That after this conversation, they go away and they think a little different and they just can't help it. Off they go, maybe a parallel or somewhat moving away trajectory in thought. That's the goal. So let's pick up where we left off in session four and let's continue to take the roof off. We left with that technique in session four and I'd like to give some more examples of how we can do that. So here are some right here. Um, here's a question we can always ask. Is that which comes naturally, is it moral? You see, there's a difference between just doing what comes naturally and principled self-restraint. And the latter is what we call civilization. If we just did what we felt like doing naturally, it would be highly uncivilized. Maybe sort of like Lord of the Flies, the book I had to read in school when I was young. So human beings are supposed to take their natural behaviors and, and make them captive to a moral reality because a lot of our behaviors are vices, really. They're not virtues. You, you think about it. I mean, for example, I love fresh-baked chocolate chip cookies. You put a tray in front of me, I'm going to eat one, two, maybe three, and I might keep going. Why? It just feels like that's what I want to do. The urge is there, the compulsion, the natural drive. But at some point it kicks in my thinking that, you know, it's probably not good for me to start on my 10th cookie or even the seventh. See, it's a natural drive. And so we have to figure this out. So in situations where these kinds of topics, these moral topics come up in conversations, we use the defense of taking the roof off. We take the roof off. So here's an example, the death penalty. One of the most revered uh, Christian figures of the last hundred years is Mother Teresa. And she made a point, she was against the death penalty. She was against it. And her position was, Jesus would forgive. So it's almost like if someone came and said that to you, is that a, a showstopper? Well, you're right, he would. Okay, I don't know where to go from here. But while this is true that Jesus would forgive and he forgives anything, is that a rationale to commute a sentence? So the answer uh, obviously is no, it's not. Why is that? Because it's a point of view that proves too much. See, see Mother Teresa's point would be that Jesus forgives and that applies to everything, doesn't it? So, so if he forgave and the death sentence was commuted because of his forgiveness, where would it stop? Would any transgression at all be punished if we followed that line of reasoning? And it would become an argument against any kind of punishment. And in this case, we then take the roof off and we would have to end the prison system entirely. So here's another example. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm just doing what I do and I don't hurt anyone. Perhaps. In fact, if you're familiar with Wicca, W-I-C-C-A, also known as uh, white magic, white witchcraft, one of the last sentences in their creed is if it harms no one, I may do it. Some version of that. So if we say, if we make that statement, I'm not hurting anybody, parenthetically, 
therefore my morality is my morality is okay whatever it is how about this how about this is a real case the doctor who molested a woman while she was sedated and unconscious she never she woke up never knew she was molested it was discovered later through video or some other means so what's the problem he didn't physically hurt her so was there any harm done I think we would all agree, absolutely there was. What about a peeping Tom? See, a peeping Tom can peep into someone's bedroom at night, see things they shouldn't see, and leave. But if a witness sees them and reports that they're arrested, but why? The person they were looking at never knew they were there. What's the harm? What's the problem? Again, I think you would agree a transgression has occurred. So, so these examples, just these two, and you probably have more of your own, point out the reality that a, mor a morality has to be much broader than simply do no harm. It must be much broader. And that is what we referred to in a previous class as the point of tension that Francis Schaeffer referred to. And there are Plenty of examples of things that are wrong to them, to people that, that do not fall into their own heading of do no harm. There's plenty of examples. There's things that anyone talking to you that you could point out would find that are wrong. They just believe they're wrong. But they don't let it fall into their own heading of do no harm. You see? So here's another example. The statement is made, this has been made to me. There is no truth. There simply is no truth. There might be my truth and your truth and all these truths walking around, but there is really no truth. And we talked about this in a previous session when we said that if someone makes a statement to you, you can say, well, is your statement true? You see, and this is often an issue with college students. I remember it when I was in college. You know, no matter what we bring into college, there's this tendency to throw everything we we've learned or valued or whatever up in the air and question it all. So here's a good question to ask somebody who says there is no truth, especially if they're a college student. How about this? If you don't believe there's truth. What are you doing here at the university where you're supposed to learn things that are true? And if you didn't believe anything you learned was true at the university because there's no truth, what are you or your parents spending their money on? You see, the fact is, this is the fact. There is truth, and that's true in the real world, and we can know truth. Um, we said it before, we are made in the image of God, and we live in a world that God has made. So we are real, and the world created world is real. Those are realities. Many things can be known about what God has made, the real world. Many things can be known about us. So the tactic review here is, when we take their point of view, and, and we take it for a test drive, remember that in a previous session, they make a statement and you say, okay, is this your view? And they acknowledge, yes, this is my view. Then you say, all right, well, let, let's take it for a test drive and see where it leads. That's taking the roof off, especially if it leads to an absurd conclusion. So we've learned the tactic, take the roof off, and we know that it has three parts, three parts. First is reduce the point of view to its basic premise. Reduce it down to its basic premise. And then as you're working with it, getting ready to take it for a test drive, you adopt it as true for the point of discussion. Something like, you know, say you're right about that. Hmm. Let's say that you're right about that. And then you start driving it. And if you're right about that, what about this? And what if we go this way, following your view? And we guide them to face 
the logical consequences of their point of view. So that's taking it for a test drive and it goes right over the cliff, meaning what? It self refutes. It turns out to be absurd or immoral if it's a moral issue. It's absurd or immoral. So that's, that's taking the roof off. Say your view is true. Let's discuss it for a moment. Let's take it for a test drive. It goes off the cliff because the absurdity of it or the immorality of it is exposed and brought to light. And then fourth, the conclusion that we can make with this is that the starting place is probably a bad starting place, meaning their original statement, an assertion, perhaps, but not an argument, it's an assertion. And see, we want them to consider adopting a new starting place. It means something must be wrong from the view, with the view, from the beginning. You remember the title for this? When we're doing this in Latin, it's reductio ad absurdum, a phrase coined by Francis Schaeffer many years ago. So why does that work? Let's, let's review this. Why does it work? Well, we have, we have the advantage, right? God actually exists. He is not an idea. He's not a wonderful thought. He's not an intriguing concept or a beautiful premise. He exists. Reality exists that he created. The world around us is the world that God created. And we are real. We are imago Dei, image of God creations. Everyone is ever born. So anybody who denies those two facts, imago Dei, real world, they're going to have to live in some way that contradicts reality. In other words, they act outside of what those two realities mean. Imago Dei in a real world, both real. So there's a tension in there. And, and in that tension, we want to help them. We want to lead them to the point where these two things collide. Their unreal life point of view, a way of thinking collides with the real, which is Imago Dei, us, and the real world that God made. So there's that tension between the way they believe the world is and the way the world actually is. Christians live in the world the way it actually is. And we exploit that tension to expose the errors and the flaws in their thinking and their views. You see, because they've erected a kind of a roof to cover them, right? A roof protects, doesn't it? to protect them from their own self-deception. And they're not seeing it as self-deception until we use Columbo tactics and questions and, and um, take their statements on a test drive to reveal absurdity or immorality, right? So, so their roof shields them from the logical implications of their beliefs, and we remove that shield of protection. We take the roof off and, and, and we want to deprive them of their false sense of security and show them where their view actually leads. Now, I got people in my life, um, family and friends, that I have already done this somewhat and I know that they stop at some point and pull out and withdraw once the error or the illogical nature of their views begins to come to light. They become defensive, resistant, and often flee. But even so, that's a stone in their shoe. I have to believe it. I'd rather they didn't, but even then, they at some point have to face their own behavior. And so we're showing them that, that they're actually borrowing, get this, this is so important, they're actually borrowing from our worldview to make points that are inconsistent with their worldview. Isn't that crazy? What an irony. What a paradox. And remember that we always use questions wherever we can. In our discussion group after class two, we talked about this. When we, when we ask people to give input and, you know, present the kind of questions they might ask with some of the comments and objections the Christianity that we've heard. And we all acknowledge that, you know, there's a tendency to want to fight back 
when someone makes a statement that we know, according to the real world and us in it, their statement is false. It's misleading. It's it's just wrong. And there's a tendency to want to say, oh, yeah, well, you're wrong and here's why. So what we do is we avoid that because we're doing the Columbo, right? This innocuous investigation that seems like we're just finding our way, but we're really asking questions in a precise manner to draw them out and expose things about their view that are inconsistent. So, so here's some homework for us. Now that we're in our last class, be aware of expressed views or held points of view that might lead to absurd conclusions if they're practiced consistently. I gotta tell you, you know what's happened to me? This is, I don't know how to take it, but I have this radar now in reading and preparing to teach and then doing the videos and, and uh, you know, doing the small group discussions on Wednesday nights. I've developed this, this radar where I will hear assertions and viewpoints that I believe are assertions and not sustainable or not arguable all over the place. And I thought, isn't that funny? That's crazy. And I think I mentioned in the last video um, that right now, at the time of this video, the election's over, the time you're watching this. But leading up to the election, we got all these uh, announcements or promotions for and against issues in the election, all of them with this, this gut level appeal, life and death and suffering and thriving and light and dark and all of that. And many in opposition to each other, claiming the other one, what was the wrong one and the, the detrimental one, and the dangerous one and the unfeeling one. Appealing to that part of us that doesn't pause and think through our views. So I hear this stuff everywhere. You might too. That's your homework. Be aware of these just in your daily life. And now I want to introduce to you our last tactic. And I got to tell you this, since I studied this tactic, I realize how many times I've encountered this in my life. And maybe there's times when I've been that person. So I think you're all going to recognize somebody you know have dealt with or are dealing with with this tactic, and it's called the steamroller. Steamroller. What an image. Just like this steamroller rolling over everything and flattening it, right? <coughs> Excuse me. And steamroller is a defensive tactic. So first part of it, we're going to teach you to recognize a steamroller when you see one. And it isn't hard to do. And then we're going to learn three basic steps we can use to stop a steamroller and put us back in control of the conversation, essentially back in the driver's seat. And these people, steamrollers, may be the hardest types of people to deal with. And they're the ones that can so easily make us angry. Just get under our skin, you know, a burn the saddle, so to speak. So here's the definition. The definition of a steamroller is people who overwhelm you have strong opinions and strong personalities. Uh, and those opinions and their, their force just comes at you like a steamroller or a tsunami. They mean to keep you off balance with a lot of attitude, a lot of noise, a lot of energy. Their words often come fast and furious, and they keep you from gathering your thoughts. You're just backpedaling like in a boxing ring, somebody swinging a million miles a second at you. You're just sort of backpedaling. And the idea is to prevent you from gathering your thoughts and responding in a thoughtful manner. Steamrollers do that. Generally, if someone is a steamroller, it's not just with you. It's, it's kind of how they do it. But it may be topical. There may be people that steamroller in certain topical areas but they're out there. And I hope it's not you, right? Look here first. All right, here's the main characteristic of a steamroller interaction. Constant interruption, constant interruption. They change the subject, they'll cut you off, they take you in a different direction. 
They jump on something you're sharing and jump right in to pile more challenges. You feel like you can't catch your breath. I can't tell you the number of times in counseling I've done this and just said, stop, please stop. Three times to get someone to stop. They're just, they're blowing right through the first stop, the second stop, and then the third stop. Like, stop, please. Oh, uh, oh, uh, what? In that sense of once they get going, it's hard to stop them. They're often tangential and circumstantial. Maybe that's how their mind works. Probably so. But you know what I mean by tangential and circumstantial. I'll give you an example of it. I had a relative many years ago who was exactly that. Tangential and circumstantial. Um, it's been 30 years. You know, she's long gone home with the Lord. But this is how it would work. She would, I would say, so how'd your day go? Well, the day went fine. The sky was blue. You know, blue is my favorite color. I mean, I've had my colors done before, and I'm a winter. I, did you even know that? I'm winter. By the way, I'm not a fan of winter. Well, I wasn't before, but I'm getting used to it now, snow and all that. Last year didn't snow much here, but the average snowfall, uh, at least nearby, is, is uh, pretty high. So, but high, nothing like when we lived in California. By the way, California, some places they get a lot of snow, but where we live, they didn't. Where we live, we've been there 30 years. We love that house. We got a great deal on it. After a few minutes, you don't know where you're going, where you are, or how you got there. You have no idea. Sometimes steamrollers can be tangential and circumstantial, connecting issue after issue after issue, and you haven't even touched the first one. And it can be infuriating if you let it get to you. You see, you could end up following the challenges, trying to respond to them, getting five words out before the next one, and you can feel yourself ramping up, and the main point is long gone. So here's the key. A steamroller will never listen to anything you have to say. Here's what I mean. You might get them to stop talking for a moment to stop uttering words. They're looking at you, not uttering words, but a steamroller will likely still be doing this. Which means what? They're just waiting for a second to get back in there. With what? A response to what you said? No. To continue their stuff. That's a steamroller. So Coco presents, his view is that they're basically insincere people. I don't know that. Maybe it's case by case, but that's his statement. Uh, he believes they don't want to deal with hard questions and it's easier to stay on the attack. I would agree with that. It's easier to stay on the attack. And for folks who are steamrollers, it's probably habitual. It's just how they do it. And they want to make you look foolish. And they'll stay on it till you are reduced down, dwindled down, or flee. They want to win. A steamroller wants to win. Now, there are some benevolent steamrollers. I have a couple in my extended family, sweet, loving, wonderful people. <laughs> Sometimes when we get together, it's once a year at least, a huge group. I'll just go drop a word and say, hey, we got a cat, and then step back because I know cat's going to get them going for the next 50 minutes, barely with, w without taking a breath. I'm telling you. Steamrolling. But they're benevolent. They're sweet. They're kind. They don't really intend to do it. They don't have any bad agenda. It's just, it just happens. So here's three strep, steps in dealing with steamrollers. And remember, they're progressive. Step one, you hope it works. If not, you go to step two. If neither step one or step two works, you go to step three as a last resort. But remember, with all the steps, you keep your cool, right? You stay cool. Cool under fire. That's the deal. Here's the steps. We stop them. Step one. Step two. If one doesn't work, shame them. Step three. If one and two don't work, we leave them. And only if it's the only alternative. So let's look at stop them. We want to stop them. Firmly and graciously. And, and you work at negotiating an agreement to go forward. You might use body English. I referred to that before. Please stop. 
let's stop here. Or I'll do this and say, how about if you, if it's a couple, you, would you stop right here because we need to give him or her a fair hearing? So I'm using hand signals. Sometimes we do that and we do it nicely and respectfully. And we might say something like this, you know, hold on a sec, I'll let you respond in a second. Or I'd like to answer, please give me a little more time to do that. Or before you ask another question, I need a moment to explain myself or to explain my point of view. Or let's stop here. I'd like to respond to your first question. Or maybe that's a good question. Let me think a minute before I respond. This is negotiating. <clears throat> and you pause after listening to them to show respect and attention and then ask, or at, no, you pause after listening, and then after they let you share, and you ask, is that a fair answer? Does that seem plausible to you, what your response is? And then you thank them. See, the idea is get them to give you permission, and it works. I've done it a number of times, and you know what? Some people have done it with me. I can get on a roll. They do it with me. So, and always, here's a rule and always rule, always respond to one issue before you allow another to crowd in. And Coco says in his anecdotal, you know, research, just thinking of percentages over time that 85% of the time, the first step works, stop them. So, but if a steamroller is aggressive, go quiet and watch until they stop. If they're aggressive, but notice, don't you become a steamroller. So, so let's assume that number one, stop them didn't work. Now we go to shame them. What do we mean by this? We don't mean like installing the shame, the deep shame of defectiveness. We just mean we want to, you know, kind of expose them and draw them out to look at what they're doing. So when we shame them, We've been forced to. Stopping them didn't work. We address the impolite behavior more directly. You be direct. Less and ask, excuse me, ask explicitly for courtesy in your conversation. Not, and not in an angry or condescending tone or mood, but let them finish and don't follow their rabbit trails, but say something like this. Feel how this raises the bar as I say it to you. I need to know if you really want an answer from me. You, you asked the question. You, you did. You asked the question. So I need to know if you really want an answer from me. Okay, you can say it that way. Another way to say it is, can I ask you a favor? Can I ask you a favor? You, you, you continue to ask questions and then interrupt me. So I just need to know, do you really want an answer. I, I just want to know what it's going to be. I just want to know. I need to know that before I continue in this conversation. So, so please tell me. Because maybe you just want to talk. Maybe this isn't really a two-way. This is a one-way and you really just want to talk. Tell me that and I'll be quiet. Just tell me that and I'll be quiet. Now, this is a more aggressive or assertive approach. And you do that if stopping them doesn't work. Now you're shaming them. And you negotiate rules. This is, this is how you do it. So, so we're trying to get them to give us permission to go forward. It's an assertive approach, but it really is negotiating. Some other things that you can say in this is, how about this? And I negotiate this with couples in counseling. With them, each other, and then with me. There's three of us, right? How about if you talk and I don't interrupt you, then I talk and you don't interrupt me. I need to know, please tell me, is that okay with you? Because if it isn't, this conversation is over. Notice how I made the last statement. This conversation is over. You're talking about a conversation. I avoid saying things like, then we have no more conversation we can do. Maybe they think they do. I'm not going to say we. I'm just going to say, 
this conversation's over. Why? Because either one can end it. Whenever they want, a conversation takes two. So you say, this conversation is over. And what I call, and Coco doesn't, Coco doesn't call this uh, what I do, but I call it rules of engagement. And when you wait for the response, what you're really getting is, what are the rules of engagement here? What are we able to do and not do? I need your help with this. That's co-oping them into the solution. So, so if you can get co cooperation on step two, remember you went to step two because step one didn't work. If you can get cooperation on step two, you can return to the steamroller's original challenge, but one only. And if they say, well, I said this, 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 and this, you, you can say, I understand you did, but I can only respond at one at a time. Here's the one I, I want to respond to. And you can play that as a broken record if they keep throwing three or four at you. You can say, I hear you, and you did list four things, but I'm only able to do one at a time, and this is the one I'd like to respond to. You see, you're holding your ground. You're not telling them to do anything, but you're holding your ground. And so you may say something like this. If they agree and they've given you permission, step two worked, it worked. They said, okay. Then you can say something like this. Your challenge is, as I understand it, and then you list the challenge, you give a response. Take a deep breath when you do it, all right? Because they've opened the door, they gave you permission, there's a rule of engagement on the table, you're following it, so far they're following it. You say, so, so your challenge as I see it is this, all right? Now this is a tough tactic, you know why it's tough? Because you're working against your emotions. You've got emotions back here, but you know, maybe they've said something about Christianity that really felt like a personal offense. Also, it wasn't out and out cursing and swearing, but it was something that really hurt you or offended you or upset you. The idea in these conversations is even when those emotions are running, you decide to set them aside so that you can confront this steamroller in a way that gives you a chance at having a meaningful conversation. So let's review. First, you stop them. If it doesn't work, and it does work 85% of the time, according to Coco, I would agree with that. Most of the time it works. If that doesn't work, you shame them. But what if neither of those steps works? What's left? You leave them. You leave them. When all else fails, you walk away. I haven't done that often. But I'm willing to, and I have done it. If they won't let you answer, and you sense like you're being pulled into something that's off track, it's unpleasant, just drop it. And you know what? It's fine if they have the last word. Remember, if you're not in an angry exchange, then the exchange can't happen because you left. And all those, those awful things that come up if you get into a fight, can't happen because you're not there. It takes two to tango, as my mama would say. So let them have the last word. It's better than being dragged into something unproductive and not useful. And you know what wisdom says? Don't waste your time with someone who does this. Just don't waste your time. And it is a waste of time. And you say, I, I can't continue this conversation. Maybe you say, I keep asking you not to interrupt you. And you interrupted me when I'm saying that. You just did again, as I said it. So it's pretty clear. I can't continue this conversation. So this, this is a similar situation to what Jesus refers to in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. He tells people, basically, don't toss your pearls before swine. And what he's saying really there is, if you have something valuable that you're offering, but they treat it like, like a pig would, throttle back, just pull out. It's not the time. It's not going to do what you want it to do. So in these steamroller conversations, these people aren't going to appreciate your contribution to the conversation. So recognize it and stop and go. Maybe 2% of the time you'll have to do this when you're dealing with someone who's a steamroller. Maybe 2%. Usually you don't have to go to that. So let's go back over, since this is our last session, 
Things we've learned in these sessions. We've learned the Colombo game plan. We use questions to gather information. The very first question, it's a wonderful question, so simple. What do you mean by that? Like if somebody says, how can you say God exists when there's evil in the world? I could say, well, when you say God, I'm curious what, what you mean. And when you say evil, I'm curious what you mean. And even when you say world, I'm not sure what you're referring to. You see, that's the first question, Columbo tactic. Next is you reverse the burden of proof, right? With a question somewhat like this. How did you come that, to that conclusion? How did you get there? What was your path? When did you begin to think this way and how did you arrive at this? Something that captures the essence of that. And so what we're saying there is you reverse the burden of proof, meaning what? They've made an assertion, right? All religions harm people. Well, you don't have to, you don't have to counterattack that and try to unravel it. They've made the assertion. You just reversed the burden of proof. They made it. They got to prove it. Not you. You don't have to disprove it. And you ask questions to get their view out on the table so you can test drive it to the logical, absurd conclusion or immoral position. And we use questions, questions, questions to advance our point and exploit the weakness or flaw in their thinking. We get their pieces on the table. See, remember, if someone says, I don't believe that God can exist because there's so much evil in the world, I'll ask questions. What do you mean when you say God? What do you mean when you say evil? How did you come to this conclusion? And then after they say, well, I did this and that, I'll say, okay, so it's your view that. That's my favorite way to do it. So I just want to make sure I have it. It's your view that. And when they say, yes, it's my view, I, I, in my mind, I see it as pieces they put on the table. They're going to sit right there for the rest of the conversation. I didn't make them say it. They willingly put their view on the table. Then we're going to be able to use those pieces to see which ones, which statements, which parts of their statements commit suicide. Meaning what? They self-refute. They just sort of kill themselves when we test drive it when we begin to logically expose it to the light. So the tactic we use with these points of view causes them to self-destruct, meaning they destroy themselves. One of the statements that does it almost right away is, I think it's wrong to push your morality on someone else. And, and you get it now, right? They missed the whole point. They're actually make a more, making a, they're taking a moral stance to tell me to not take a moral stance. You see, it just self-destructed. It actually had a built-in self-destruct, and we're just seeing it and exposing it. Because our job is to recognize when a view is self-contradictory, and we point it out by using these questions. And then a second way we expose it is to take the roof off, right? We show them the consequences the outcomes of the belief they have, their view, if they hold it consistently and we test drive it, it shows the natural outcome or consequences of their view. And then we talked about the steamroller. I so I hope this is a game changer for you. Uh, with the steamroller was our last tactic that we taught. I hope all the tactics that we've taught you through these five classes and that you've read in the book, Tactics by Greg Kokel. I hope these are a game changer for you. And you know, the idea is that we've talked about it enough, reviewed it enough, and I'm hoping that you've practiced it. You've gone out there with your radar and you've heard those assertions that aren't real arguments. They're not cases that are being built. They're just assertions. You, you, you know, right in your own mind, if not in practice with the person, you know how to take the roof off and help them see it. And I hope that you're putting all this into practice. Why is that? Well, this, is, this leads us to apologetics. See, all these tactics help us set the table at some point for others maybe to come along and harvest what we've gardened. Harvest the seeds that we've planted by doing what? Putting a rock in their shoe a stone in their shoe. We, we've helped their thinking shift. So our hope is also that you have been studying 
all along, and maybe even long before you took the classes, but certainly now. Books, great materials, listen to great teaching online, and then go to world-class apologists, William Lane Craig, speakers with Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. Ravi is home with the Lord now, but Abdu Murray still uh, is on the speaker panel. There's like 40, 50 others. They're brilliant. Frank Turek, um, the One Minute Apologist. Uh, there's just endless places you can look to get great information and study because there'll come a point in conversations where a question's put on the table and you just might have the answer for it. Isn't that great? You would have the answer for it. So these questions and these tactics were designed by Coco to be something anybody can do, anybody. And, and I will say there's great generalizability. In other words, these tactics generalize to other areas of life. I use it in counseling. I use it when I go to West Marine and buy parts for my boat. I say, so you're saying, what, what, what your view is on this product, I mean, I'm going, gee, many Christmas, I'm using tactics in here. <laughs> so remember, throughout this whole time, whenever you're engaged in tactics, any form of apologetics, but any form of conversation with a non-believer, if you're a believer, you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ and Christianity. And remember, an ambassador represents the interests of the one who sent them. So we're doing that whether we're in conversations using tactics or just driving down the road and getting gas somewhere. We're always ambassadors, but tactics will help you have conversations that are less threatening to you, less fearful, more engaging and respectful, but, but persist forward towards what? Towards a target. Like an arrow, we have a goal in mind. We are gardeners. Every gardener has a goal of what? To make the, the harvest great. They may not be there for the harvest. They may not be a harvester, but they have a goal. A goal is a great harvest. That's our goal. And so throughout this whole uh, uh, class series, what we've all also emphasized is, is character. Let's be people of high character, reliable, consistent, and trustworthy, as our Father trusts us to represent his kingdom to a lost and broken world. See, Jesus in Matthew 28, which we know is the Great Commission, really, really appointed us to the job. He said, all authority under heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you, and surely I'll be with you until the end of the age. And before he left in John 14, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm leaving, but the Holy Spirit will come. And the Holy Spirit will remind you of what I've taught you and teach you all things. You see, we have the Holy Spirit. We have Jesus living within. We can do this. I look forward to having discussions with all of you in the future, in the future, and I look forward to hearing how this is going for you as you grow in your ability to use tactics in the, in the world of apologetics, defending the faith and presenting the faith as truth. I'm going to pray and close this. Father, I thank you for all these sessions, these, these times that uh, these beloved people, brothers and sisters in Christ, have uh, watched the videos, purchased the book, read through the book, attended the small group discussions online. I pray that each one, Father, you would just embed these tactics and their purpose into their hearts and minds so that they become easy to recall. They become automatically um, available to them when they're in a situation and they're the right way to go. I pray that you would do it for them. I thank you that they're committed to do the work for you to help uh, as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. I pray all these things. Thank you for everything that's been done for this moment, but certainly for everything to come. And I pray in confidence and faith. I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless. I've had a blast. We'll see you around the church. Bye-bye. Thanks for viewing the teaching online. Please join us for a time of discussion beginning at 6.30 p.m. To join, please visit our Wednesday night at Shoreline online page on our website and click 
join discussion for the tactics class. We'll dig deeper into the truths we just heard and spend some time in fellowship and prayer. See you there.